Historians studying the long-distant past must piece together clues about past civilizations from artifacts, artwork, and what documents and journals they can find from the period. However, luckily for historians studying the most recent past, photographs exist to capture quite literally the goings-on of history. But it's not always quite so simple. Although a picture is worth a thousand words, they can also leave us full of wonderment about the life of history. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three instances where historical photos gave us a strange glimpse into what life was like many years ago. Historical Playgrounds Playgrounds might not be an area that one generally thinks of as being dramatically changed from past years, but photos from the early 20th century tell a very different story. Playgrounds in this time period were still a fairly new concept. The first playgrounds originated in Germany, usually in conjunction with schools, as a place for children to develop good manners and social skills. But the first playground in America wasn't built until the late 19th century in San Francisco, California. As America was in the midst of industrialization and faced increasingly dirty and crowded urban areas, playgrounds were seen as excellent options to allow children to run and play getting a chance to experience the fresh air and social interaction that is so important for developing children, but so hard to come by in the city tenements. In 1906, the Playground Association of America was created in order to help plan and construct playgrounds in the tenement areas and in communities across the country. However, Photographs from this era show that the brightly coloured, enriching and largely safe jungle gyms that we think of today could not be further from the reality of the early 19th century playgrounds. The photos show children on playgrounds across New York from 1905 all the way up to 1942, playing on all manner of poles and bars as the industrialised city rises up in the background. The equipment is generally made of small interconnecting poles, creating structures that stretch high into the sky with nothing but concrete to catch anyone who might fall from the insubstantial bars. One picture depicts children swinging from thick ropes hanging from a single pole, while another features a structure supporting only freely swinging ropes and ladders that extend at least 10 feet into the air with no support or safety mechanism if a child were to fall from such a height. Rings, ropes and ladders extended high over hard surfaces are a common feature in many of these photographs and seem to be a popular feature among the children fearlessly swinging and climbing an astonishing distance above the ground. Steel poles seem to be the material of choice for climbing and jungle gyms, with no handholds or footrests in sight. Although the Playground Association of America was orchestrating the construction of these areas, it seems that they were operating without any consideration for the safety of the children using them, which likely made the structures even more of a hit for their target audience, while simultaneously creating an inadvertent survival of the fittest situation. Although there are those who would argue that the relative blandness and danger of historical playgrounds would increase a child's creativity, independence and fearlessness, there is certainly no doubt that the safety-centred jungle gyms of today leave far less children seriously hurt or wounded. Margaret Hamilton and the Apollo Project Everyone is familiar with NASA's Apollo program that landed man on the moon for the first time, but many don't know the details of the process that led to such an extraordinary feat even being possible. The project took an amazing amount of brain power from a fleet of top minds of the day. One of those brilliant minds was Margaret Hamilton, who was in charge of the software engineering division of MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. Eight years before the completion of the Apollo program, MIT was contracted by NASA to develop the in-flight guidance system that would ultimately be responsible for landing man on the moon. This left Hamilton in charge of a never-before-accomplished feat of software engineering. Clearly, she was able to successfully complete such a daunting task, but the enormity of her contribution was not fully appreciated until a photograph began circulating that was taken in 1969 upon completion of the project. Taken by a staff photographer for the instrumentation laboratory, the caption reads, 
Here, Margaret is shown standing beside listings of the software developed by her and the team she was in charge of, the Lunar Module and Command Module on board Flight Software Team. The pile of papers bound into thick volumes stands higher than the young woman herself. What is even more jaw-dropping is that those mountainous stacks are full of the software code that put man on the moon. Such a visual representation of the vast amount of knowledge and work that must have gone into just one element of the moon landing makes the picture all the more impactful. At the time of the Apollo project, Hamilton and a large portion of her team were only in their twenties and were working in a field that was fairly new, largely uncharted and not well understood. Her work as the leader of this team allowed her to leave her mark on history as not only an instrumental part of such an extraordinary feat, but also as a pioneer in the development and popularity of software engineering. So much so that she is one of the people credited with coining the term software engineering in the first place. In 2016, 47 years after the moon landing, Hamilton was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama for her work on such a historical project. This photo only serves to emphasize the contribution of Margaret Hamilton, a young woman in an overwhelmingly male-dominated field who orchestrated the creation of one of the most important pieces of software of the day, the program that would guide man's eventual landing on the moon. Mount St. Helens Eruption The eruption of Mount St. Helens is one of the largest natural disasters in American history, and without a doubt one of the deadliest volcanic eruptions the country has ever seen. On May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., a powerful 5.1 magnitude earthquake in southwest Washington state struck, triggering a partial collapse of one side of Mount St. Helens that then triggered a massive landslide across Earth already destabilized by the previous earthquake. The landslide was the catalyst for catastrophic explosions that erupted out of the volcano, sending ash, volcanic gas and detritus over 80,000 feet in the air and absolutely ravaging the surrounding land. 230 square miles of the area around the initial blast were totally razed and lay scorched and burning. The eruption produced around 520 million tons of toxic ash that blew across the town of Spokane over 250 miles away, causing complete, penetrating darkness as the thick ash choked out every last particle of light. The massive amounts of ash even made their way across parts of the entire globe in about two weeks, and the volcano continued to spit ash and steam from its mouth for weeks following the initial blast. The photos that were taken during and after the explosion are an incredibly powerful testament to the destruction and devastation that was brought on the surrounding landscape and towns. They depict trees laying flattened outward, looking more like sticks scattered around the mouth of the volcano than the massive forest that they used to be, and the pillar of smoke rising from the site of the explosion almost unbelievably dense and billowing. The residents of nearby towns such as Spokane and Yakima, Washington, were forced to wear masks and face coverings to protect from the white ash that caused the streets to remain hazy and dense for days following the blast, and photos show loved ones embracing despite the masks and citizens working to clean up their towns with gas masks strapped to their faces. Flooding triggered by melting ice and landslides shows entire houses swallowed up by the swells and mud, looking incredibly small in the massive, disaster-raised landscape. The Tootle River overflowed its banks by four feet, leaving feet of mud that trapped residents who were forced to dig their way out. A photograph of an airport with planes stuck on the ground due to the unbelievable amounts of ash darkening the entire sky, choking out the sun. The ash trickling to the ground was so thick that an entire car disappeared underneath it, and all that remained was the top poking out of the ash. Fifty-two people passed away in the horrible explosion of Mount St. Helens, and the cleanup and recovery took months and even years in some places. However, now the destination is a popular retreat spot and the site of important ecological studies, and this recovery is all documented through the powerful photos that were taken during the days and weeks following the explosion. 
so that the struggles of the community and the incredible feat that was accomplished as they rebuilt what had been so totally demolished can be fully appreciated by future generations. As historians study our past and look back at the years, photographs provide a way for the people who are no longer here to tell us their stories. It is true when they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and these words can make people feel connected to the past in ways that simple text in a history book recounting events cannot. But what do you make of these interesting historical photographs? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.